right, so let's start. So today um, we start the next chapter. Difficult to say, it, maybe the last one we'll see, or maybe there will be one more. Depends on how we fare. And it's called path integrals and quantum mechanics. A and I should say, that's in some way both a very exciting and interesting and very disappointing topic because uh, so we'll construct today something which looks very, very promising and very interesting, but uh, unfortunately it does not exist. And uh, this makes the topic kind of an interesting topic for mathematicians because uh, already for um, several decades there are efforts to, uh, to define or to make sense of those path integrals. Those, uh, those efforts are partially successful but not fully successful. So we'll see what, what those things are and we'll see also some of the attempts to make sense of them. But actually, um, before diving into path integrals, we will be talking still about the Schrodinger equation, uh, but uh, we will be looking at the time dependent. So the first topic will be the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So let me recall that the equation says that the uh, um, evolution of the wave vector or of the wave function is given by this differential equation ih bar times the time derivative is the action of the Hamiltonian. So for the Hamiltonian as usual will be we'll be looking at minus h square over 2m times the Laplacian plus potential. And this means that we need to solve the following the following PDE ih bar dc over dt is equal to minus h square over 2m Laplacian of Psi plus V Psi. So that's the PD that we are interested in. So you know our strategy, right? So we are always starting with the example of the dimension equal one and the potential equal zero. So that's called the quantum free particle and this means that the differential equation that we are looking at is ih bar d psi over dt is equal to minus h square over 2m d to psi over dx square. So um, let's first look at the um, solutions of the form exponential of i kx minus possibly some function of k omega times t. So these are not L2 solutions, but we'll remedy it relatively soon. So um, what would be omega of k in order to solve this differential equation? Well, um, so the left-hand side, uh, so the left-hand side, what would it be? It would be h bar omega k times the exponential and the right hand side will be h square k square 
over 2m again times the exponential and this gives the the function omega of k equal to h bar k square over 2m so um, so this formula is known as the dispersion relation so that's that's a kind of physics term but um, so let's make the following remark let me rewrite this function this solution psi of x t let me rewrite it in the following form so this is i k and here I would like to write it as x minus omega k divided by k times t so you see um, so this this formula shows that this is actually a wave traveling with the velocity omega of k divided by k, right? So this, this is called the phase velocity. And this is now equal to omega of k over k. And this is equal to h bar times k over 2m so we've got a wave of course the, right that's that's intuitively clear right it's a free particle free particles move somewhere so um, so here the phase of that free particle moves in this case uh, to the right this uh, or to the left, depending actually on the sine of k, right? So it moves with that velocity. Okay. So now um, let me um, let me continue a little bit, looking at the uh, um, looking at at the situation of a free particle. And um, so let me recall that the uh, Hamiltonian, right? So this is by definition the second derivative. And one of the ways how we understand it is the following. So we can take the inverse Fourier transform composed with multiplication by k square and here the direct Fourier transform right so that's that's one possible way to understand this formula now let me recall that uh, we introduced the evolution operator so that's the unitary operator of that form and in particular, if you want to act by that operator, let's say, on some psi naught, uh, we can use this presentation of the Hamiltonian. So, uh, so how would, it, would, would the result look like? So I start with some uh, wave function at the time moment t equals zero, and then I want to translate, translate this guy with the evolution operator. Well, um, so there will be this inverse Fourier transform. So then there will be exponential of minus i and here h k square over 2m times t, right? So that's, that's the exponential of that guy. And here the direct Fourier transform psi. Uh, so note that here we again we again see this dispersion function omega of k, right? Here in the exponential. 
Well, now let me just uh, rewrite it one more time. So that's this inverse Fourier transform. And here I write, I write this function. So this function is exponential minus i omega of k c. And this function just by definition, right, let me denote it by, so the Fourier transform of psi is psi tilde of k. Um, so one can understand this formula literally when uh, psi naught is nice enough, right? So this is always an you know, L2 Fourier transform, but this is actually just this integral. Um, if psi naught is nice enough. Right, so, so, so we get, we get this, um, this nice formula. So we get this nice formula for the um, um, solution of the Schrodinger equation, time dependent Schrodinger equation, with uh, initial condition psi naught, right? Um, so now let me discuss a little bit this story. Uh, so this discussion goes under the name of wave packets. Um, so let me, let me do the following. So let's say this is a k-axis. And this is a function psi, the Fourier transform, psi naught tilde of k. Of course, I cannot quite draw graphs of such things because it's a complex valued, complex valued function. But um, so let me choose some point k naught on the k-axis. And let's suppose that psi naught tilde is uh, supported somewhere near k naught. So I will now say precisely in which way. So, so I assume that the Fourier transform is concentrated near some point on the k-axis. So, um, so let me introduce the following, the following notation. Um, so first of all, let me introduce something which is called the group velocity that probably those of you who studied physics know it very well. Um, those who didn't study physics, maybe not. So by, by definition, so you see we, we had this phase velocity here, which was omega of k divided by k. So let's introduce another gadget which is a derivative of omega. So in our case, this is uh, equal to hk over m. So you see, they're actually quite different. This group velocity is twice bigger than the phase velocity. Okay, so let me introduce Two more pieces of notation. So, um, so let me introduce. Let me introduce uh, a number called kappa, which is equal to. to the integral over r k minus k naught to the fourth times psi naught of k squared tilde dk 
1 to the fourth. And in particular, let's assume that this quantity is finite, right? So, uh, so I assume that my initial wave packet, right, since it is supported near K0, this quantity might be finite, so let's assume it is actually finite. And let me introduce the function phi of xt. And it will have some funny phase that I will write down now. Um, but it will be essentially It will be essentially the function psi naught, which is traveling with the group velocity. Right? So I have my wave packet, whatever it is. I've decided to choose its center, k naught. And for this uh, center, I define you see this definition, who knows, maybe it makes sense, maybe it does not make sense. So I define something which is called the group velocity by this formula. And I prepare a function which is just the original function traveling with that velocity uh, times the phase. And well, the phase is kind of a little bit ugly, but So let me, let me write it down in that way. But of, course, but of course, we can, in principle, open all the brackets. And um, so um, what will it be? Uh, I think it will be actually h k naught square over 2m, the whole, the whole thing. So actually, this is. Uh, this is again omega of k naught, but with a plus sign times t. So it is it is some phase. Uh, so that may be somewhat ugly formula. This is a shorter formula. So so this function is traveling with the group velocity, and there is a phase. Now um, here is a simple simple theorem. It says the following. So the um, so there is an estimate on the L two norm of the difference of uh, the true solution psi of x t and the solution phi or solution the, the function phi of x t and this estimate is like this it is t times h kappa square over 2m. Um, so the L2 discrepancy, the L2 mistake between the true solution and this function phi um, is proportional to t. So yes, it does grow uh, with t. And then times uh, times this uh, times this quantity now this quantity if the wave packet is uh, really small around k naught right if it's uh, if it's supported if it's concentrated on some small neighborhood of k naught so this kappa will be small maybe very small and this means that actually for a very long time the difference the l2 difference between uh, these two things it will be very small and controllable of course later on something will happen so this this is not the true solution unless you you are very 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 small around k naught but for some time uh, that's a good approximation. 
So actually, uh, this theorem is a justification for introducing uh, uh, for introducing this uh, group velocity. So actually, it's a strange thing, right? We we saw that the phase is traveling with the phase velocity, right? The phase goes uh, in with the velocity which is tw which is twice smaller. But um, but but the uh, but the amplitude, you see, the, the phase something happens here. But the amplitude of the wave function, this means the probability, it travels with this velocity. And that's an interesting, you can say, mathematical or physical phenomenon. So maybe uh, just to imagine how it looks like, right? So how typically a wave packet would look like. It is, uh, it is something like this, right? So if you, if you imagine that the Fourier transform is really centered around some K0, so you will have some very dominant frequency. And then, well, yeah, somehow there is, there is something like this. You will see an explicit example in the next problem set. So now it is, it is traveling this time, right? So then, then probably this wave packet typically it becomes larger in space. Um, so, so this this would be something like something like this group velocity times t. But the phase velocity, how to tell exactly? Right, the phase velocity tells you where this whatever sine function where would it have peaks. So this travels uh, with the velocity which is half of it. So in order to determine where the peaks are precisely, in order to determine the phase, you need to look at another velocity. So it's, it's a kind of, of course, this phenomenon, it's not specific for quantum mechanics. It's just, uh, it just the phenomenon of wave propagation with some dispersion relation which is not uh, which is not necessarily linear right we have a quadratic dispersion relation so the group velocity differs from the um, uh, from the uh, uh, phase velocity okay let's prove so that's a very simple theorem let's prove it Well, parts of it don't want to erase. Hmm. Oof. Yeah, sorry, I should probably move my stuff. Okay. Um. So the proof. Um, first of all, we know that the Fourier transform of the true solution, right? So we know that this is well, this is given by, by this formula, right? In terms of the Fourier transform of the original function at zero, at the time zero. So that, that we know. Now let's compute the Fourier transform of the function phi. Well, it will have this uh, funny phase, whatever it is. Uh, I think we decided, we'll see whether it's correct. I think we decided it's actually plus omega of k naught could it be could it be true possibly okay uh, and and then uh, this will be an integral minus i k x and here psi naught we decided minus omega prime of k naught times t. Um, 
dx. But now, well, um, that's essentially uh, the Fourier transform of psi naught. We just need to shift here. We should subtract omega prime k naught c and add omega prime k naught c, right? So the first part will just give us the shift of the argument. So, and the second part will uh, will will have to add it to the phase. So in total, it is omega k naught uh, minus k omega prime k naught. Everything times t. Um, and here simply psi tilde naught of k. Right, so, so basically the Fourier transforms, they are both proportional to the Fourier transform of the original function times the two different phases. So now let's see uh, what's the difference between the phases. So um, now we have omega, let's say omega of k, uh, or maybe m minus, yeah. Yeah, maybe I want to, t to subtract from this one. So I take omega of k naught minus k omega prime k naught plus omega of k, right? So that's the difference between the two phases. Now, uh, if you write it down, um, so this will be h over 2m k minus k naught square. So that, that will be the difference between the phases. So phi tilde of kt is, and this is, yeah. So h over 2m k minus k naught square times t times psi tilde kt, right, okay. Well, so finally, for the L2 estimate, so let me take the square of the L2 norm. Um, we know that um, that's the same. So we can make, a, we can apply a Fourier transform which is a unitary, unitary operator. So that's, that's the same. And now we can rewrite it as exponential i h over 2m k minus k naught squared c minus 1 psi tilde of kt square. And uh, that we can estimate in the following way. So this will be an integral over r. And here I make a very cruel estimate. So the absolute value of this guy, I'm Simply, I'm simply replacing by the uh, by by this thing in the exponential, right? So that's uh, that's a very so that's a very 
true estimate for the absolute value square of this guy. But, well, and here uh, I, I, I would like to write the absolute value of psi tilde squared, but you know, psi tilde and psi naught, they're only different by phase. And so the phase doesn't matter, so I can write down psi naught. Um, so this guy is what? Let me write it as a square of something. And this something is t times h over 2m. Uh, and now by, uh, by definition, write the integral k minus k naught to the fourth times psi naught square, that's kappa to the fourth. So here I should write kappa square. Uh, right. Okay. So, and this, this is exactly the estimate that I wanted. Um, so it's an interesting, it's a very simple-minded but interesting story. Um, so I would like to show you, I would like to show you one more formula for the um, evolution operator. And this formula is actually the starting point of the pass integral formalism. Hmm. Well, hmm. sorry, but if all my formulas do stay on the board. Okay, well. So proposition. So suppose psi naught is in, in the intersection of L2 and L1. Um, so then, for t non-zero, we have the following formula for solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with the initial condition psi naught. Well. So here is, there is uh, some square root, m over whatever, 2 pi h bar, but it's, uh, it's interesting that there is a square root of t in the denominator. And then there is a funny phase, minus i pi to the 4, over 4. And then uh, there is an integral over r. And here I should write it correctly, the exponential. I am over 2t h bar x minus y squared Sorry, is my formula still visible with all those traces <coughs> of previous formula? <laughs> okay <clears throat> so, um, so that's a beautiful Beautiful formula. Maybe before proving it, let me um, let me make a remark on notations and on the names. So we can say that this formula is saying psi of x t is an integral over r of some kernel k t of x y <coughs> psi naught y dy. So this is an integral operator. Before we were always looking at differential operators, this is an integral operator. Uh, so this function kt of xy 
Well, sometimes you say it's the kernel the evolution operator, or sometimes what is saying it's the propagator. So these are the words we use. Of course, from here we can read what this kernel is. So it is basically you just need to to copy parts of the formula. Everything with the exception of the um, of the integral. Ch. Yeah. So that's the kernel. for the quantum free particle. And as I say, so that, this formula, <coughs> that's basically the springboard uh, for defining uh, Feynman pass integrals. Um, okay. So let's give a sort of proof. Um, somehow today, um, I don't want to do too much of uh, functional analysis. So we'll be doing it for nice psi naught. For instance, we can say that psi naught is in the Schwartz class. So uh, rapidly decaying at uh, de decaying faster than any power at infinity. So of course, this, uh, why, why, why do I want that? Because otherwise, of course, I need to struggle with that integral. But if psi naught is nice, then the integral is more or less, of course, it's an improper integral, but it behaves as if it were a proper integral. I can differentiate, for instance, I can differentiate under the integral sign without much thinking of it. Um, so, so the first point, uh, let's simply differentiate our function. Um, so let's compute. So let's use this formula and let's simply compute um, uh, what happens. So let's compute what happens when we take a T derivative. So when we take a T derivative, uh, let me write it in the following way. So there will be still this square root and the phase. So here there will be an integral. Still there will be this this phase. And now I would like to co collect the factors. Right, so the, the, there would be some factor coming from differentiation of the square root of t, and this will be a minus i h over 2t, right? So the derivative of square root of t minus 1 half, 1 over t to the power 3, 3 half, square root of t I left, left there, and so that's that what remains. And then there will, be, there will be a derivative of this gadget, right? So, uh, so this will be, this will be what? This will be um, minus, is it minus? No, plus, plus m over, uh, to t, right? And then x minus y squared. Uh, could this be true? T squared. T squared, right. T squared. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, no, 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 I may be the minus sign, right? Could it be? 
Um, well, that's, that's always, always tough. I think plus, plus, yeah, plus because, right, okay. Yeah, no, that's this calculus, it's really tough, right? Okay, so that's, that's, that looks correct. Now, um, minus h square over 2m d to psi over dx square. Well, so now this goes really untouched. Now we have the exponential. So now we need to take this uh, second derivative, right? And uh, the second derivative will give us what? h square over 2m. And if we differentiate the exponential, if we differentiate the exponential twice, so then uh, every time we get, uh, we get i, m over th x minus y and this is all squared, right? So that's when we differentiated the exponential twice and I think unless I'm mistaken it should it should match with this term, right? And now when we differentiated exponential once and then we, we differentiated the factor that we obtained, right? So then this would give us, uh, this would give us what? Minus h square over 2m and here we'll have uh, i m over th. Right, so that's the derivative of the linear factor. And again, if I'm not mistaken, so those terms should match. So just by, by this simple computation, mm, the function that we obtained, it solves, um, uh, it solves the, uh, um, the Schrodinger equation. Now, what remains to show? Is this. That, uh, so this formula, yes, it is. Uh, it is valid for t non-zero, right? For t equals zero, it does not make quite sense, right? There is a lot of t, t in denominators here in the exponential over there. But still, we want to know that, that this was the initial condition. And um, I think we'll look into it after the break. So how, how this limit looks like. Okay, so let's have a break. Um, all right. So let's continue. In fact, in order to prove this, um, I would like to make some digression and recall a couple of things. So first of all, let me recall the calculation of this integral. Um, so um, so what, uh, what we usually do in order to compute it, right? That's the integration quantum. And uh, what we do, we shift it into the complex plane, right? So we say that actually the difference 
we'll go to zero when we go to infinity, so that's easy to prove. So we, we are replacing it by the integral over the counter like this. And here we can introduce a new variable. Right? And now this becomes the uh, the standard Gaussian integral. So this this is then equal exponential of i pi over four times the square root of pi. over s, is it correct? Yeah, I think hopefully it's correct. Um, so related um, related to this calculation is the um, stationary phase method. So recall that we were looking at the steepest descent formula a couple of classes ago. So the uh, stationary phase is um, the following statement. So we now have an integral of the form. So exponential of i s f of x. So s will be again a large parameter. So here may be some other function, g of x dx. And um, we assume, we assume that um, f of x has a unique extremum, let's say at x equal to x naught. And let's assume to simplify things that it's a minimum. So f double prime of x naught is positive. Uh, so then this integral behaves as exponential I s f of x naught g of x naught square root of two pi s f double prime of x naught exponential of i pi over four. one plus O of one over S. So that's the formula of a similar nature to the uh, um, steepest descent. Again, the uh, uh, integration domain is negotiable. You can probably take any integration domain which contains X naught. Um, and the result will still hold true. So, um, right. So why are we interested in this formula? That's because our integral, right? So um, our psi of xt Unfortunately, I erase the formula. If I'm not mistaken, uh, how is it? Um. 
So I hope I reproduced it correctly. So because our integral when t is small is exactly of that nature, so we can put the big parameter s to be equal to 1 over t. So here we have the quadratic function in the exponential. Obviously it has a unique minimum at uh, x equal to y. So we can simply use the uh, stationary phase formula. So that's what we get. So here, well, the value of f at x equal to y is simply equal zero. So we get psi naught of x. That's this function g. We get exponential of i pi over four. So now we see where this funny phase came from. That's to compensate the phase which came originally <coughs> by turning the integration quantum in computing the uh, com complex Gaussian integral. And now um, we'll have square root of uh, uh, 2 pi, and then uh, we should divide by the derivative. Uh, so, so here we'll have uh, ch over m and here 1 <coughs> plus O of t. Right. So now everything cancels. So psi of xt is psi naught of x plus times 1 plus O of t. And this means that it goes to psi naught of x when t goes to zero. Right, so we actually do solve, so this, this integral is actually a solution <coughs> of the Schrodinger equation and with the <coughs> correct <coughs> with the correct initial condition. Maybe mm, One more remark. Um, you can easily write an analog of that formula in dimension n. And let me let me simply write down the, the propagator. So um, you, you get it simply by taking such a formula for each of the um, spatial directions. And here exponential i m over 2 t h. And here x minus y square, meaning the Euclidean length square now in the space of dimension n. So. so that's the direct analog of the formula that we got before. All right. Um, so one more um, so one more um, uh, preparation before doing path integrals or before defining path integrals. Um, So I actually, we already looked at this, or we already saw this formula once uh, in the course. Maybe now we prove it. Maybe I state 
maybe I state it as a theorem for unbounded operators, but in practice, in practice I will give a proof for bounded operators. So suppose we have two self-adjoint operators. So let's assume that the intersection of the domains is dense. And let's assume that the operator A plus B defined on the intersection of the domains is essentially self-adjoint. Then the following is true. for any psi in H. So for any vector, for any wave function, the following um, limit So we take the action of these two unitary operators, right? They are all unitaries. So we exponentiate them with i, so they are all unitaries. And um, so this tends to zero when n goes to infinity. Sometimes people also introduce some real parameter, but it doesn't matter because this basically amounts to rescaling the operators by, by this real parameter t. But there is one more part of that theorem. It says if in addition are bounded from below. Then you can actually make a similar, you can play a similar game with real exponentials. So I'll give a simple-minded proof for A and B bounded 
if you really want to do it for A and B unbounded, one has to really work. Um, okay. So, um, so let me introduce annotation. Let me denote by U. exponential of i a plus b over n. So I will be only proving this, this formula. And let me denote by v this product. So they are both unitaries. We are actually looking at the operator u to the n minus v to the n. And I can represent it by the following telescopic sum. So I let you check that this is actually correct, right? So these, 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 all those terms, they will kind of cancel each other and the only thing which remains tangent will be u to the n and v to the n. Um, so this implies that the norm, um, the norm of the difference um, is estimated by, well, we have n terms here. And actually, uh, these guys are unitaries, so they don't change the norm. So actually, it will be only the norm of the norm of that guy. So now, um, so let's, uh, let's look at this expression. And let me recall, this is actually, we even proved for um, uh, unbounded operators. If I'm not mistaken, this is from problem set eight. So um, if you take n exponential I A plus B over N minus identity. Then when N goes to infinity, it tends to I A plus B. Um, in fact, for bounded operators, this is simply true by using the Taylor expansion. So you can use the formula for the exponential. It converges in norm. You just use the Taylor expansion and you get that. In the case of unbounded operators, what we proved, so this is true strongly, which means it, it's true on all the vectors. They are the norm estimates, of course, wouldn't work, but on all the vectors, it works. So, okay, that's good. Now, um, uh, what about this one? Minus one. So let me rewrite it in the form. So 
So then this guy tends to 1. So this product tends to IB. That product tends to IA. So this, this goes to IA plus IB. So this means that N times U minus V, it's equal to N U minus 1 minus N V minus 1. Now we see that both U minus 1 and N V minus 1 times N, they tend to I times A plus B. So this guy tends to 0. And for bounded operators, it actually tends to 0 in the norm. So, uh, so this means that uh, the norm of this guy tends to 0 when n goes to, to infinity. And that's, uh, that's even a stronger, stronger statement that we announced, but that's for bounded operators. Otherwise, you have to do it strongly on on vectors. Otherwise, you, th there would be no norm convergence, typically. OK. So why were we interested in this, uh, in this Trotter formula? Um, so the um, wonderful, very interesting complication of the Trotter formula is the Feynman pass integral. So we choose A to be the Hamiltonian of a free particle. and B to be the potential. So um, we would like to write down the action of the evolution operator acting on psi naught, right? So this is equal to exponential minus I over H, the Hamiltonian, which is A plus B, times T acting on psi naught. And we would like to replace it, right? We say that this is the limit of N going to infinity. And here we have exponential minus i over h, a, t over n, times exponential of minus i h, b, times t over n. So everything in the power n acting on psi naught, right? So that's just the application of the Trotter formula we saw before. All right, now we can actually write it down. So, um, so recall that the operator B is simply the multiplication by some function. So actually we know how to act by that operator. And then this operator, we also know what it is. So let me start writing down the formula. So let me call the argument of psi naught by xn. So then this last operator, how does it act? It is exponential minus i over h. And here v of xn 
times t over n. Well, how does the next operator act? Well, we know how it acts, right? Somewhere here, there will be an integral, uh, exponential i m over 2th, x n minus 1 minus x n square. Uh, sorry, this should be this should be uh, t. So here, this would be t over n, right? So, so, so I should um, I should probably put in put in n, right? Okay. So, and here dx n minus one, and somewhere here, right? This should be m. Um, could you help me? What was it? m over 2 pi h and now t over n, right? And here to the power n over 2 where n is the dimension of the space. Uh, but then, well, so that, that, that's just the first instance of this guy, right? Then, then there, will be, uh, there will be here exponential minus i over h v of x n minus 1 t over n and then blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, so, so there will be all those integrals, and eventually here, I have to multiply. I have to multiply by n, and also uh, there is this uh, minus i pi over four times n small n capital, right? So there was exponential minus i pi over four times n small for each, for each, uh, for each action of those guys, and now there are capital n of them, and here of course not to forget the limit of n going to infinity. All right, so that's an interesting formula. Um, so, and it has positive, there are positive things about it, but there are also negative things about it. So let's first start with positive things. Um, so let's look at all those exponentials, right? So we have an integral. Um, so let me start rewriting it. So first of all, there is some kind of uh, um, t-dependent constant in front of everything. So this, this kind of expression. Let's first ignore it. So then uh, there is an integral. dx1, dxn. So then let me write it. Let me write the phase. As exponential of i over h, that's how we like writing phases, but that's just notation i over h of some a n of uh, x1, x n, and then finally here there will be psi naught of x n. So here is the, uh, the constant which depends on n and on t, right? And here of course there will be a limit. So note that this expression is an expression for, for the propagator of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but now for a very complicated one with, with arbitrary or arbitrary, arbitrary reasonable potential. Of course, the Trotter formula 
still needs to make sense, right? There, there are some assumptions, but still, this is not now for a free particle. It's now for something which is really complicated. But of course, the formula is also mm, rather complicated. So now, uh, let's write, let's look at this phase. Over n minus one variables. Yes, that's right. So, uh, right. So the yeah, good. So this is yes, z x two, and here this is psi of x one. Is it right? No, maybe not. Actually, maybe not. No, well, let's say uh, maybe here x0. Maybe here, or oh, maybe let me write it like this x, x1. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that, that will be. I think I, uh, I, I, have, I have n copies of that guy, so I must have n integrations. But then there will be one more variable which we can call x naught, right? So there will be the, the, last, the last variable, which is the variable sitting here. Okay, so what is, what is this phase? So let me write it down in the following way. Um, so now that here I already have i over h. So I will have a sum. I will say what are the limits in the sum in a second. So m over 2. Here will be, let me write it like this. aj minus aj plus 1 divided by t over n squared j from 0 to n minus 1 minus minus v of x j plus 1 times t over n. So it's a little bit of perverse writing, but um, have a look. Is it correct? I think here, right, I divided by t over n I'm, and I multiplied by t over n. So here in the first term I got t over n squared just, just, to, just to get the common multiple t over n. Uh, but now you see that's a kind of... Uh, now imagine Imagine that we have some kind of uh, path, let's say sufficiently nice, sufficiently smooth path, x of t, or x of s, let's say, path for s uh, between 0 and t. I must say, maybe I should have I should have started, maybe I should have started with x0 and go up to xn. Do, do you mind if we change? Maybe, maybe that's, that's a healthy. Um, so let's say here it was, it was 0, so this was 1. And if we do like that, then we should subtract uh, or maybe xj plus 1 minus xj from 0 to n minus 1, and here will be xj, sorry. Right, so suppose, uh, suppose we got a sufficiently smooth path, which goes from 0 to t. So then actually the expression that I have here, this is a Riemann sum.
for the following integral right so that that's just the fact that one of the possible Riemann sums so I split my uh, interval into n pieces and here I take some kind of approximation of the velocity here I decided to to take the right the right the whatever the leftmost point of the interval okay I so so that's a possible Riemann sum for for this expression so therefore uh, Feynman came up or I mean there is uh, there is a big discussion of course that's uh, uh, whether other people had similar similar ideas but um, um, it was coined by Feynman and it's called uh, Feynman's pass integral so Feynman came up with the following let's let's say conjecture um, so k okay, of uh, yeah let's let's say x y so this is equal to some constant integral Um, and here x so what is the conjecture the conjecture is that uh, on the space of parts there is a measure that we denote here dx of s and well we consider parts which start at some point so let's say so that's our space Rn that's our um, that's our points x and y so we consider all possible nice parts x of s which travel between y and x from time 0 to time t so uh, this expression, this exponential is clearly a functional on this path space, right? we compute uh, this functional that's called in classical mechanics the action functional and we integrate it against that measure um, so the result is supposed to be the, uh, um, the propagator of our problem which uh, allows us to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation starting from any reasonable initial data so that we can call the Feynman conjecture So this is, uh, this is a very, very beautiful and inspiring expression, right? So you see, kind of, uh, all of a sudden, we give an answer to a relatively complicated and, let's be honest, uh, some, some kind of boring analytical problem. All of a sudden, kind of it's a completely different language, right? So we have some parts, some functionals. In particular, it gives you a lot of physics intuition. For instance, what uh, kind of usually a physics textbook on quantum mechanics has more or less on the, if not on the first, then on the second page. This is a so-called double slid experiment. So that's when you, uh, your particle starts traveling from some source and then there is a wall with two slids. 
And then you want to know what happens on the other side. And then you're saying that, well, the particle usually prefers to go straight. It's a free particle. But then here, it doesn't have much of a choice. If you want to see it here, well, there are basically two good ways for it to go. One way is like that. When there are no obstructions, it more or less travels straight. You can argue for that. And then from the first slit, it has to go there. And or I, it can go that way. So you see, you can argue that actually in this uh, complicated integral, maybe in this case, there are basically just two reasonable parts. So there will be just two contributions. Those two contributions you can easily add. And I think next time it will be one of the problems in the problem set. And you can, you can determine what happens there. There is some interesting picture which actually matches experiment. You know, like kind of, it has direct applications in physics. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, the Feynman's conjecture, as I stated it, is uh, completely wrong. So, uh, or maybe better say, in mathematics, there is nothing like this. And essentially, that's because of the following. So this gadget that I kind of uh, introduced into the game, right, uh, more or less approximating from, uh, from this gadget, right? I had the integration over those piecewise, uh, uh, piecewise linear parts, so I, I had some in reasonable integration measure here. So there is no way to make the limit make sense. Maybe one int intuitive point is, so this should be some kind of Lebesgue measure, some kind of translation invariant measure. And then if you imagine a ball in an infinite dimensional space, it contains an infinity of balls of the size twice smaller, right? But then what would be the volume of that ball? It has to be more or less either zero or infinite. So there is no, no other other reasonable value for it. But then if it's zero, then it's not very good, right? If it's infinite, it's also like bad news. So whatever you do, so this, uh, this thing basically does not exist. But then it's, it's a significant obstruction on making sense of it. So uh, the remaining two lectures, we'll try to see what we can do, what we can still make out of it. So as I say, there, are, there, there is a huge effort invested by the mathematical community into solving this problem. So like making sense in some way of the Feynman's pass integral, you can say this is one of the major open challenges in mathematics. So physicists are using it every day, thousands of them, tens of thousands, to a great effect. As I say, it doesn't make any sense. Now what? So it's a, it's a highly irregular situation, which already persists for many decades. So you, you, you should do something with it, right? Okay, so, so we'll, see, uh, we'll see the next two lectures, what people are doing with it in the meantime. Okay, that's it for today.